It is two o'clock. Uh, we are going to make sure we stay on task. Um, we have 20 minutes each and 10 minutes for Q&A each. So I will get started. Um, our first presenter is Martin Klein. He is a scientist from Los Alamos National Laboratory Research Library. Uh, Martin Klein is a scientist and lead of the prototyping team, <clears throat> excuse me, in Los Alamos National Laboratory Research Library. In this role, he focuses on research and development efforts in the realm of web archiving, scholarly communication, digital system interoperability, and data management. He's involved in standards and frameworks such as Memento, Resource Sync, Signposting, and Robust Links. Martin holds a diploma in computer science from the University of Applied Science Berlin, Germany, and a PhD in computer science from Old Dominion University. Welcome, Martin. Take it away. Thank you very much, Mona. Uh, I assume you can see my screen. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I apologize. I, I try to run this in sludge uh, um, uh, presentation mode, but for some reason, my computer thinks differently. So I, I hope this, this works. I apologize. Um, I hope you can see my slides. And I'm, of course, happy to share those slides as well uh, at any point in time. I'll do this immediately thereafter. So um, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you today about our core Notify initiative, where, uh, as you will probably see uh, within the next you know, 20 minutes or so, uh, we're, we're trying to leverage standards, uh, web standards, to uh, uh, facilitate linking of uh, resources on the web related to uh, scholarly communication, of course. So I will outline by means of an example of how this translates to, for example, linking preprints with their corresponding uh, peer reviews. So maybe to start with a little bit of background of the uh, project team, you will probably recognize a number of names and faces on this slide. Uh, so uh, we have uh, Kathleen Shearer from CORE, Paul Walk from Antleaf, Eli Rodriguez, and myself are the four co-PIs on the project. And uh, the, the team is supported by uh, Tammy and Carla uh, with, under the core umbrella as well. So that's kind of the, the core uh, group, pun intended, uh, the, the four PIs of us. And uh, we were uh, very fortunate to receive significant funding from the Arcadia Foundation that really enabled uh, uh, us to push this effort forward and really uh, elevate it, bring it to the next level. We're fortunate further to have a couple of uh, technical advisors that uh, make sure that we're, uh, uh, we, we adhere to those standards that we propose uh, that give us uh, more background uh, on the technical level, namely Herbert van Zompel and Patrick Hossenbach in uh, Ghent. So this is a an effort, an initiative that, of course, has not started just yesterday, right? Uh, as you are probably aware, uh, CORE as an organization has been concerned uh, um, with notions of interoperability, standards on the web, and uh, how our repository environment plays in this realm uh, for quite a while. Uh, specifically, I'm thinking of the NGR, the Next Generation Repositories uh, Initiative that CORE started um, by now five, six, seven years ago, uh, where the effort or the emphasis really was to elevate repositories to, uh, to, to a level where it can build a foundation on which we can build value-added services that then uh, uh, support you know, the notion of, of innovation and maybe even uh, value-added services that uh, um, help towards you know, making the argument for sustainability, of course, as well, right? Uh, Pub Fair was another effort that I personally actually was not involved in, so I can't uh, overly intelligently speak towards that. But it, uh, in, in, in terms of the concept and the uh, overarching ideas, I'm sure you can can see similarities there, how this uh, how this all came, came to be. So the core Notify project, <clears throat> excuse me, specifically uh, tries to... Um, uh, establish an environment where we can link and connect uh, research outputs, various forms of research out outputs that are hosted on a distributed network of uh, repositories with uh, resources that live elsewhere on the web, uh, specifically from external services, such as you know, a peer review service, if you will, an overlay journal, if you will. So connecting these, uh, these, these resources is really the, the main objective of the core Notify project. And uh, we've all been involved in interoperability-ish uh, projects that have gone nowhere or uh, hit barriers for adoption. Uh, so we, we learned those lessons, uh, I believe, and uh, we're really trying to build on standards as uh, one core principle in order to lower the barrier of adoption. 
So we don't need to, you know, build another protocol. We're building on established W3C standards on the web to facilitate our core notify um, project. Initially, uh, and there was also uh, uh, conveyed, of course, to the funder. Initially, our focus within the project is to uh, interlink preprints hosted on various preprint servers with um, a peer review uh, um, resources hosted on various uh, peer review services. Right. So the the preprint peer review interconnection is our our specific focus. Uh, initially in the project. However, as you'll see uh, towards the end of this presentation as well, there are other use cases that are absolutely in scope uh, for, for this project that we will tackle, that we are in the process of tackling, we've begun to tackle. And uh, I would also go as far as to say there were probably other use cases that we currently don't even think about yet that will eventually be in, in scope. So at least that's that's my hope. Right. So a little bit uh, of diving deeper into this notion of uh, of the infrastructure that this uh, built upon, and uh, of course core wouldn't be core if we're a not building on on the repository world and b also building on a decentralized distributed ecosystem uh, that we can take advantage of because that's where the the value uh, I think lies to connect resources in a distributed environment, right? Um, in order to do that, we have to build on on on, uh, on standards. So, as I mentioned already, we're using uh, established W3C standards that are outlined uh, in a second in in more detail, and we're focusing on the on the notion of connecting uh, preprints uh, and and peer review services at first. I think it's important to stress that uh, we're, we're establishing um, a. Uh, a concept here that really builds on a, on a research-oriented approach, right? So we're not uh, um, making uh, repeating mistakes from the past, trying to copy bits and, and entire files back and forth. Now we're operating on the notion of uh, by reference. So we're just sending uh, pointers, we're sending URLs, we're sending PIDs uh, uh, as a as a payload of our messages. Right? So we're not copying entire files. Uh, everything that we we send back and forth to establish linking is based on this by reference principle, not by value. All right. I, I already mentioned the notion of standards. These are two of the standards of our core standards that we're really uh, are building our principle on. For uh, for one, that is the um, the standard of linked data notification. I'll, I'll um, elaborate um, uh, on this a little bit more in a second, but it's basically very simple HTTP transactions, uh, which as you can probably guess already, really lowers the barrier of entry because our repositories live on the web. They all speak HTTP. So we're just adding more HTTP messages to the mix. No, uh, no further, you know, development needed in a way of establishing a new protocol. The light turned off. <laughs> uh, uh, no, no additional protocol uh, needed to uh, um, to be part of a notify universe, if you will. And activity streams too uh, is uh, another standard that we're using that you may or may not be familiar with. If you're not familiar with that, it's not a uh, uh, not a problem at all. It's a very simple standard that uh, defines our payload of our messages, and I'll show you an example here in a second. It's actually quite uh, convenient and human readable. All right, uh, this is the canonical diagram when you talk about linked data notifications. And without going into details, but you'll recognize most likely a couple of methods uh, on, uh, on the web for the HTTP protocol, specifically the get and the head and even the post me method. So those are very established uh, uh, methods. This is how the web works. We're using these methods 100 times a day, well, more than 100, hundreds of times a day. Uh, everybody does. So again, we're utilizing existing standards. Our uh, participating implementation partners don't need to establish a new, a new protocol. The system administrators don't need to you know, open crazy ports and things of that nature that have, uh, um, from our experience, at, at least in the past, really hindered uh, adoption of new initiatives and uh, uh, communication uh, concepts, right? So you can kind of think uh, of linked data notifications not as a, that dissimilar to email as a, as a as a means of communication. Very simple messages sent back and forth. Right? Uh, so as you, I'm sure, you recognize here on this uh, diagram as well. You have a sender and receiver, a target. So you uh, you you send a message from somewhere to somewhere else, uh, identified by means of URLs. Right. So uh, um, a very very simple um, communication protocol, if you will. 
And Activity Streams 2 is uh, the standard that defines our payload of our messages that we're sending back and forth. And that will probably become a little bit clearer in the next few slides. And this uh, uh, slide here on the right-hand side is not necessarily meant to be uh, read and studied in, in detail. I realize the font is very, very small. Uh, but you do maybe get the notion of, oh, there's a, there's an actor and there's a context and there's a, a, a target where you send a message to. And you'll see there's no bitstream in there, right? There's no PDF attachment, if you will. This is all by means of uh, sending things by reference. Only uh, uh, URIs and URLs are included in our messages, which keep those, um, those messages sent back and forth between interacting parties very lean and very, uh, very light, which, uh, you know, helps... Um, uh, for one in, in uh, adoption, of course, but also helps in, in terms of, of resources and um, speed is probably a, a matter there as well, right? Uh, as you can probably uh, make out here on this slide, uh, the our payloads are JSON LD, so that's really uh, neat for machines and you know uh, developers like it. Um, and again, uh, very minimal metadata passed in, in these in these messages. We're trying to keep those messages very slim and uh, in, in, in just as few uh, uh, ontologies and other you know vocabulary as uh, as possible uh, to to really uh, focus on the notion of uh, simplicity. And of course, interoperability, right? The leaner the message, I would argue, the higher the chances for interoperability really are. Uh, but of course, there's a, uh, um, a balance to be struck, right? To, uh, in terms of expressiveness of these messages as well. All right, so maybe let's take a couple of minutes and look at an example use case to uh, bring this a little bit more uh, to life and uh, to hopefully better outline of what these sort of connections uh, are about and what they can actually uh, bring to the table in terms of value for parties that are interacting with each other, right? So I mentioned our initial focus is um, uh, on the on the linking uh, between a preprint and um, a, a peer review, a, a corresponding peer review that has been conducted or will be conducted, and uh, a couple of our initial or first actually implementation partners within the project are the uh, preprint service HAL in France and uh, PCI as a peer review uh, um, uh, organization, if you will. So these two parties are already um, uh, playing in the Notify uh, ballpark. They are Notify compliant, if you will, and they can already send messages back and forth. And uh, uh, let me briefly outline of how those messages uh, could be sent and what they can convey. So let's assume on the left-hand side here on the slide, I have my Hull repository. And on the right-hand side, I have my uh, PCI peer review um, uh, um, service, if you will, right? So now I upload my preprint into Hull. Uh, I will get a URI, of course, uh, that identifies this preprint. Let's say that is URI P. As the author now, and there are various different scenarios of who can actually do this, but let's assume for the sake of simplicity that me as the author, uh, I'm interested in um, requesting a peer review for my just uploaded preprint uh, identified by URIP. So Hull offers me the opportunity to uh, send a linked data notification that uh, carries the notify payload to PCI. And that notification says, hey, uh, there is a preprint uh, uh, hosted at Hull identified by URIP for which I would like you uh, to conduct a peer review. That's basically uh, in, a, in, a, in a human consumable way, basically what this payload uh, of this linked data notification would say, sending from Hull to PCI. So PCI considers, well, this is in scope, right? Uh, can I actually do this? Do I have the resources to do this? Um, is this in a domain that I'm familiar with or and or have uh, peer reviewers? Uh, that are uh, you know capable uh, and available to do this peer review. But let's assume for the sake of argument, PCI says, yes, this is good. I can do this. Uh, we have the resources. And then PCI would respond with yet another linked data notification back to Hull and uh, acknowledge the request for peer review, right? It's a very simple, very straightforward, very short notification actually saying, okay, I can do this. I will do this. All right. So at this point already, we have... Uh, two pieces of information that I think are worthwhile sharing. A, Hull, on the one hand, can say, oh, uh, by the way, you know, remember this, this uh, preprint uh, pre that was just uploaded, uh, identified by URIP? It is currently undergoing peer review. Right? That is a piece of information that Hull would probably want to uh, share to the with the world. 
And on the other hand, PCI can say, well, you know, I'm, I'm cu currently conducting a peer review on a preprint that lives over there on, uh, on, uh, in, at, at Hull. So uh, right, we're already connecting the dots to an extent. We're already uh, uh, providing value for both parties that are interacting here um, and enable them to share knowledge that otherwise would be somewhat silent. All right. At some point, of course, PCI will be uh, com will be finished with completing the uh, the review. And uh, as a side comment, how this review is conducted, right, and uh, what uh, methods this is under, whether this is uh, you know double blind or not, or, or three reviewers versus four reviewers, that is all basically a black box to the Notify protocol uh, as a as a concept as a protocol. Um, this is completely out of scope. We don't care about this because that's that's vastly different. Uh, it depends on which peer review service you're talking to. Right? Uh, that's a level of detail that this initiative, this protocol, uh, does not operate. So the peer review is conducted. Let's say for the sake of argument, the peer review is indeed available on the web. It has a URI. Let's say it's identified by URIR. So this resource also is available on the open web. So now PCI would send another link data notification again back uh, to the HAL repository and announce the availability of the peer review back to HAL. Right? So peer review is conducted, peer review is published, let's say for the sake of argument, the URI can be shared with the HAL repository now again. And what that enables us to do is really connect, fully connect this, uh, uh, this graph, if you will, right? Now we really have two parties that uh, can point to each other's resources in a way that the HAL repository can say, I have an, a, a preprint uploaded here, uh, your IP, which has been peer reviewed. And if you're inclined to look at the peer review, it's available over there on the PCI platform at uh, URIR. And of course, on the other side, PCI can say a very similar thing, saying I have conducted a peer review, which is available here on my end at uh, URIR, and it refers back to the um, the preprint that I'm not hosting, but uh, Hull over there is hosting it. Right, uh, uh, a link back to the preprint, if you will, that was uh, the basis for the for the peer review. Right. So now, with a very simple interaction between these two different parties, we have created a connection between these resources hosted at, a, uh, at, at a distinct entities in a uh, distributed, very small in this context, but still a distributed network of, uh, of services and platforms that are now uh, uh, able to link to each other. I uh, mentioned initially that there are other use cases that are beginning to come into scope, if you will, for the Notify project, because as I'm, I'm sure you already uh, uh, can, can imagine now, by means of sending very lightweight linked data notification between different parties, different entities, whether those are repositories or peer review platforms, there are other scenarios where those messages come, can come in in a manner of, of really building uh, value added uh, uh, incentives or scenarios and, and therefore incentives for, for these parties to um, to be part of this universe, right? So for example, uh, let's assume we have a, a repository, let's say it's a DSpace repository that hosts uh, my PDF uh, papers at my institution. Well, I also uh, have some, some, some code and some data sets that I uh, so happen to upload to different repositories because uh, I like them for it, right? I like a Dataverse repository, let's say for my data set, and I like an Invino based repository, let's say for my code. Well, these three distinct repositories, distinct parties, in and by itself, uh, don't know necessarily of each other, and they surely don't know of a, a preprint that lives in my DSpace uh, repository that uh, uh, comes with a data set and also with a snippet of code uh, relevant to my publication, right? So there's an, uh, a scenario where I could combine the, or not, not combine, but where I could link to these corresponding resources, because um, eventually my uh, preprint repository probably would be good if it if it linked to the corresponding data set uh, that uh, comes together basically with my uh, preprint. And it would also be good if it linked to the code reposit uh, the repository and the code that I uploaded to, to NVIDIA. And of course, from the NVIDIA's and from the data point, data verse side of uh, things, it's a very similar uh, thing, just the perspective is a different one, right? So there's an interesting um, uh, scenario of where, uh, let's say, repositories that are focused on different aspects could could be interlinked right? and uh, i'm not going into into detail much further in a couple of other use cases but just to uh very briefly outline those uh so the the notion of a um uh, living breathing dynamically growing data management uh 
uh, service or system, if you will, could really benefit from from an uh, uh, interlinking of resources like that, right? So uh, whenever, for example, I upload something to to Zenodo, my like the uh, um, my data management plan would could could receive a message and uh, would grow dynamically, uh, maybe even um, uh, actively whenever something happens. So it could be kind of a uh, log file, if you will, something that uh, uh, that is triggered whenever a relevant resource to my data management plan uh, is um, uh, is uploaded to a public interface, right? Um, another use case that I'm excited about because I come from the uh, digital preservation world uh, to, to an extent is the notion of uh, uh, adding an archival layer uh, to, to this concept. Very similar to the previous uh, use case where the data management plan is kind of uh, uh, um, receiving messages of something happening. Similarly, you can imagine an archiving service that is uh, receiving messages upon the ingestion, let's say, of a, of a data set into Zenodo, and uh, uh, it could trigger an archival process to actually create an archival copy of a data set or create an archival copy of the preprint living in a repository. And then uh, we would have, again, a fully connected graph of, for example, the DSpace repository being able to not only, of course, uh, host its preprint, but also link to an archival version of the preprint, link to the code, let's say, and also link to an archival version of the code, right? So that enables, enables uh, uh, many more scenarios that we can uh, uh, probably think of in this context here by means of simple, simply sending uh, very lightweight messages uh, between these um, repository systems back and forth. One of the things that I wanted to stress here at this point is you, you probably noticed that I've, I've used various different logos for various different uh, repositories and repository systems and uh, software, right? And that is exactly the point. <laughs> uh, because all these uh, players live on the web, so they all speak HTTP. Uh, therefore, uh, um, the, the notion of interoperability, because we are building on those standards, because our messages are based on just HTTP uh, messages, uh, all these players are, can can very easily play in this realm, right? It doesn't matter whether uh, you know your repository is a DSpace flavored one of version four versus five, or a Zenodo or a, a, an, an Invenio repository, right? Uh, as long as you you play on the web, which all these parties do, uh, we are uh, we're in scope, right? This is all uh, within uh, the, the realm of, of uh, possibilities here. So a couple of other use cases that I wanted to stress because I'm, I'm excited about those <laughs> is um, uh, something uh, for one that is also in scope of the project, uh, but, but not initially, but uh, will increasingly play a, a larger role, just the notion of an overlay service. Uh, right, so an um, overlay service that would interact, for example, with a preprint service in order to, uh, you know, conduct peer review and then, uh, um, you know, uh, publish a version of an uh, of a journal, for example, if you will, or do a, a, um, a recommendation or an endorsement of of, uh, of sorts, right? So that's a, a, a not too abstract of a use case, uh, thinking down further down the road. And then, of course, not of course, but something that that excites me is the notion of well. Even if we step away a little bit from uh, this, let's say, traditional notion of peer review and maybe even the traditional notion of a publication, uh, there's a lot of potential here that we could tap into, right? So maybe this is just as simple as a matter of, oh, can we can we facilitate an uh, authentication check of a, of a resource, of a scholarly artifact? Uh, and that check could be facilitated by means of sending notifications back and forth, right? Uh, you can imagine like maybe a, a button that says, you know, authenticate for me, someone else, an authentication service does its match magic and sends a notification back, a very uh, a simple use case where um, value can, can easily be added, I imagine. And uh, similar if we're, you know, uh, uh, blowing up a little bit the notion of a, of a publication and think about, you know, blog posts or tweets or micro publications, maybe those are in scope also, right, for maybe not a peer review, but maybe some, uh, uh, some sort of an annotation or uh, uh, a feedback mechanism that could be facilitated by uh, uh, very quickly and simply sending messages back and forth. And things that we've heard from uh, potential and existing implementation partners also is the notion uh, of, of interest of interlinking 
versions of a preprint with uh, versions of a uh, um, uh, of that preprint published by a commercial publisher in a journal, let's say, for example, right? Something that we, we frequently hear that is currently not well supported of a system uh, where, where that sort of a interlinking would be would be really beneficial to make clear, okay, this has been uh, published in a journal and you may need a subscription for that. There's also a preprint version and uh, it, it lives over there. And that was actually uh, subject to peer review that eventually led to the journal publication for example, as a scenario, right? So those things are all potentially in, in scope. Uh, some of them are better defined or uh, more uh, uh, well-defined right now than others, but this probably, uh, uh, all of these things are basically on the table, I guess is what I'm saying. Right. So with that, I I'll, I'll think I'll conclude here uh, uh, with a couple of uh, pointers for, for further reading, if you're so inclined. Again, the, uh, the, the names of our collaborators, because this is, of course, not just me, um, the number of people involved in this sort of an effort. If any of this resonates, if you're curious about this, if you feel or see yourself uh, um, uh, wanting to become a partner and an, an implementation partner and uh, uh, send messages, get the value. Uh, uh, play notify basically please do get in touch uh, we're most happy to talk to uh, to talk to you about any and all of these things and uh, 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 with that I think I'll, I'll hand over to uh, to Mona again thank you so much for listening I really appreciate the opportunity of being here um, yeah happy for for any uh, discussion I'm not sure whether we're doing this now or at the end of the session we will go ahead and do it you. now yeah okay. we have some time thank you so much Martin uh, it looks like we have a couple of things in the in the chat a uh, question from Melissa. Will this interplay with DocMaps, another initiative to collect, distribute metadata regarding documents on web being used for preprint peer review? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good question. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa. And um, uh, the, the short answer is yes, it can. Right. Uh, so we are in uh, uh, somewhat frequent uh, communication with the DocMap folks. Uh, we've been uh, actually I've been on the technical advisory board for for DocMaps for a while. So there is a clear uh, th there's a little bit of overlap in a way that we're addressing similar use cases. Right. The, uh, as you point out in your question, the use case of peer review on an uh, on an object that lives on the web. So there's a similarity there. I think where our approaches uh, differ is that we're sending very simple standards-based messages back and forth that really just point at the notion that something is available, right? So we're just announcing basically the availability of a peer review on the web, for example, or we're, uh, we're sending a request for a peer review versus uh, DocMaps, uh, um, I, I think, has an approach of ingesting information into the payload of a message that outlines how the peer review was uh, conducted, for example, uh, similar to, let's say, a log file, if you will, of what happened. What, these are all the things that the document uh, underwent, right? Uh, peer review round one, uh, a single blind reviewer X, Y, and Z, orchid of the reviewer, those sort of things. So that's a little bit more um, the, the by value notion, I think, uh, 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 ingesting actual content into um into into a message um so i think that that's where where this differs uh, a very um uh i think an obvious um uh, intersection point which we communicated and uh, um you know tentatively agreed on the doc maps is we uh, with the notify could easily for example announce the existence of a doc maps or the uh the update uh, the, of a doc map uh, resource, right? For example, so the, uh, we're basically operating at that level versus doc maps uh, um, uh, document. Um, I'm sorry, operates a little bit on the on the lower level there, if that makes sense. Great, thank you. And we have a question, a bit off topic, from Kate. She would love to hear if anyone has a list of sources of referee reports available for research, preprint or not, pre-publication or post. Very flexible. I'm not sure I understand the question, to be honest. Sorry, that, that's so off topic. And I've gotten some useful information in the chat. Let, let's move on to another question that's directly related to these very good presentations. OK, ha happy to connect uh, maybe offline. Uh, um, Kate, to make sure that I understand and, and maybe can throw my two cents in. All right, we have one more question uh, from Melissa again. Um, it's a follow up question. When do you think core notify might extend out beyond one to one messaging, for instance, uh, Europe, uh, PubMed Central collecting notification? Mm -hmm. 
So that's a that's a really good question, Melissa. Thank you again. Um, so linked data notification by design or one to one communication uh, is a one one to one communication principle, basically. Um, however, there is it is probably a logical next step at some point to uh, envision something like a hub, right, or an aggregator that would uh, maybe relay messages on someone's behalf. Uh, so if you're thinking, again, of a, a somewhat decentralized infrastructure, um, uh, that 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 is something that I could see happening, right? So uh, similar to email lists, right? You send it in, in, to, to one spot, basically, and then it branches out from there. So that, that's uh, that's entirely possible. It has not come up, uh, to to be honest, as a as a use case. Uh, I think maybe we're it's a little bit premature for that, but um, I don't see a reason why this shouldn't be in scope. Technically, surely that's possible. Uh, there are probably then, you know, uh, notions of, of authenticity and, and verification and those sort of things of messages. But um, uh, we were probably on the web and looking at web standards again, we have uh, ways and means of uh, dealing with that or at least addressing this to an extent. So I think my short answer would be uh, we're not there yet, but um, it, sh it certainly is, is feasible and probably should be in scope down the road. So right now we have a, a, a four-year funded project with the generous support of the uh, Arcadia Fund. Mm, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be shocked. Let's say it this way, if if this uh, shows up in the second half of the project, if that helps. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, terrific presentation. Great questions. Uh, we are now going to move on to our next presenter, Pius Gamet or Gametti. I'm. I, Please correct me, Pius, if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Um, okay, one moment, please. Just let me uh, switch over. So, Pius, go ahead and start, and I will go ahead and introduce you. Um, Pius Gamete is a library assistant, researcher, and teacher with 10 years of experience in research and academic environments. He's currently in the PhD program in, in economics at the University of South Africa. He holds a master's of philosophy in economics and a BA in economics from the University of Cape Coast and Kwame uh, Nkrumah University of Science and Technology respectively. He currently works with the scholarly communication unit, Sam Jonah Library, University of Cape Coast. Before joining the University of Cape Coast, he was a research assistant at the Methodist University Ghana Library. He's part of a team that trains librarians in the use of online journal systems in Ghana and reviews for economics journals. His main areas of interest are scholarly communication, open science, innovations in libraries and in analysis. He has participated in annual conferences organized by the Consortium of Academic and Research Libraries in Ghana. Go ahead, Pius. Thank you. So I'm looking at re-engineering the global scholarly communication system from a perspective of three, that is diversity, equity, and then inclusion. So So this is a brief outline that I'm looking at the introduction, issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, the state of affairs, why we need to consider diversity, equity, and inclusion, general support for diversity, equity, and inclusion, the, then the role of stakeholders, then a conclusion, and then recommendation. So I have a short teaser here. Society cannot share common communication systems so long as it is split into worrying fashion. So because of diversity issues, biases in diversity, equity, and then inclusion, the scholarly communication system is, seems to be in this array. So from the introduction, we've witnessed considerable events over the past few years with issues of COVID-19 and then increased activism and racial justice protests. So it has generated a lot of discourse on structural injustice and biases in key areas, especially in academia. So the scholarly communication system have also begun to take shape. And then journals have begun to institute measures in dealing with biases in areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Hence, stakeholders with the 
view of editors, reviewers, and authors have also begun to realign their rules in order to bring the needed change in the scholarly communication system. This is a short statistics on scholarly communication and the issues that is happening there. So we have 62% of scholarly journals in the social science citation index coming from developed countries like US, UK, and others. And then most of them, where we have a greater percentage of 90% are in English compared to other languages like French, Spanish, Chinese, and uh, other African languages. And then 7% are also open access and it's coming from land, a study conducted by land in 2021. So when we talk about diversity, we are looking at representation of individuals and groups based on their life experiences and perspectives in terms of race, their ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, disability, neurodiversity, their socioeconomic status, their nationality, language, and other factors. It's also because of the essence of our discussion, we will be looking at the makeup of an editorial board in terms of how diverse is um, the editorial board of a particular journal. So if we look at the diversity issue, we can look at it from different, different perspectives in terms of the journal that is being considered for publication, how many of them are coming from different geographical areas? In Africa, how many of them are coming from Asia? How many of them are coming from North America? How many of them are coming from Europe? Then we also talk about accessibility. How many people have access to their scholarly work at the global stage? Most of them have been uh, being in paid versions. So access to these scholarly works are not there. Then in terms of the languages, as we just saw, most of them are in English. 90% of them, as per the study of land, shows that 90% of them are in English. Then when we come to the review at the composition of the review, review board, we see that majority of them are coming from the developed countries as compared to developing countries like where I, I am coming from, Ghana. So it looks like, like the board, the review, the peer review process is being led by only developed countries as compared to developing countries. Then when it comes to authorship, how many of the authors do we see at the global stage? We look at it from the perspective that majority of publications are being done at the developing world and is being shared with um, readers in the global south. So I have a, a diagram here which, shows, uh, which looks at diversity from the big picture using university presses. We see that from the first pie, uh, pie chart, we see that 81% of them are coming from white, the white race. We have 65% of them coming from women. In terms of orientation, 79% are straight. In terms of disability, 88% of world publications in university places are coming from non-disability persons. And this shows how, the di how diverse the scholarly communication system is. It is skewed towards a certain group of people in terms of race, in terms of gender, in terms of orientation, and in terms of disability. So, but then the picture is not that gloomy. There are other areas of the world that have an, a, a bright picture to show us. So if you look at it, I took a, a statistics from the UK Publishing Association where we have 52 of the executive leadership being women, 55 of them are also in senior management position. We have a composition of different people from different races we have 0.3% who are also from the transgender society. We also have 8% of people who are, in, who are disabled and 46% of them have mental health challenge. But then because I am also at the university, I also try to bring out the picture at my local university where we have 16 journals and from an examination of the scholarly communication system within my university, we have 192 males as compared to 32 females. If you look at the editorial board in terms of diversity, we don't have any 
disability person on any of the editorial boards. There is no person with a neuro who is neuro uh, neurodiversity. We have most most of the editorial board members are either Ghanaians or Nigerians. If it comes to socioeconomic status, all of them are academic in, within the academia. In terms of languages, 15 of them are in English. It's only one that is bilingual. So this tells us the kind of picture that how diverse the scholarly communication system in terms of general management looks at in my university. Then we look at issues of equity. It looks at policies and the impl implicit practices that prevent a group or individual from assessing, sharing knowledge and receiving acknowledgement from for their intellectual labor. So if people are being acknowledged, then we see that there's some kind of equity. It also looks at resources, the technology available, and also the systemic disparities that are, that are evident across the world. We also look at, in terms of professional advancement, how is it like in terms of women, in terms of Black, Indigenous, people of color, and then LGBTQ scholars too, who are also pushing for a representation in the scholarly communication system. So in terms of equity, you look at it in, in the area of access to information. Majority of the journals from my point here has to be paid before we can have access. It's not that there is a growing um, advocacy for open access. However, we see traces of biases in publishing where a lot of people have their, their manuscripts being rejected. We also find funding disparities where if you are not part of a group or, an, or a society, your research is not being funded. Then in terms of scholarly recognition, it is low in certain areas of, across the world. In developing countries in Africa, we find out that in terms of scholarly re recognition, it is very low compared to other developed areas like Europe. Okay, so from the global perspective, how is the gender equity like? So I here, if you look at the peer review from the diagram on the left, you see that there are too few women doing peer review compared to their male counterparts. So in the first one, if you're a reviewer, we had 20% of them being reviewers as compared to 80%, 20% of reviewers being women as compared to 80% of reviewers being male. We also saw that 27% of women get their manuscript being published as first authors as compared to 73% of males having their manuscript published as first authors. When we look at the diagram on the right, we also identify that in terms of first author, in a share of 100%, we see that ma majority of them are being occupied by male, the males compared to their female counterparts. So in the area of uh, biomedical sciences and health sciences and then life sciences, see that males dominate as compared to the females when they are first authors. In physical sciences to male dominate, it's only in the social sciences and humanities that we have females having a little edge over the males. When it comes to last author, in terms of the position of authorship, last author, we see that males also dominate in areas of biomedical and health sciences, life sciences, the physical sciences, and then except social sciences, as we also saw in the first authorship uh, situation. So equity, in terms of equity to at the University of Cape Coast, currently we don't have a policy with, we don't have open access policy. However, it is being worked on at our unit where I work currently, we are working on the scholarly, we are working on the open access policy. In terms of sharing of scholarly content, it, it used to be in hard, uh, hard copies and has to be transported. However, we've started using the OGS system, which I, we have been training other librarians on it. And now sharing has become a little easier. Then in terms of restricted access, now people have 
access compared to first. However, it is limited. And then in terms of financial sustainability measures, these journals rely on their mother institutions or their parent institutions. So for example, the University of Cape Coast journals rely on their institutions for support. In terms of inclusion, we are looking at the sustained action and long-term stewardship of policies and practices informed by a diverse set of perspectives. So we look at voice, voices and perspectives that are often silenced. So we want to talk about inclusion, total inclusion. Everybody should be brought on board in the scholarly communication system. So in terms of language, where a lot of languages that are dominating the scholarly communication system is in English. We are encouraging that we have diverse languages like Chinese, Spanish, Russian, um, it, and then other African languages like Hausa, where we will have people in the editorial board and the peer review processes where they'll be able to understand and review it and help build the scholarly communication system. Then we talk about accessibility. Now we have open access that is gaining grounds in Africa. So we are looking at a way where people be included so that they will have access to all published journals without discrimination. Then we also look at institutional support where institutions will be brought on board, research institutions and other academic institutions will help in the scholarly communication system. Then we also look at the cultural perspective where cultures around the globe will also have proper representation in the scholarly communication system. So we have festivals in Ghana, festivals in other parts of the world that are very popular where people can write on them and be included in the scholarly communication works across the globe. In terms of geographical inclusion in peer review, we find out that majority of the peer review individuals who are, are part of the peer review process are coming from the United States, followed by China, UK, Japan, and we have Malaysia um, having close to few numbers engaged in the peer review. If we look at the, the diagram carefully, we don't find any African country there. And we think that a lot of Africans should be encouraged or should be invited to be part of the peer review process when it comes to the scholarly communication, the global scholarly communication system. Okay, then in terms of the UCC representation, we have a general management policy which is in place. Then there was also a stakeholder meeting where we had the directorate of research and innovation consultancy. We had the some journal library, which is the main library of the university. Then there was also presentation from the various editorial teams of journals, where we had chief editors, the assistants, or their administrators. There were also presentation from faculty, research fellows, and scientists. And these were professors, senior lecturers, lecturers, and other assistants, graduate assistants, who were represented. And there was a stakeholder meeting on how to manage journals in the university and also sustain them like other journals across the world. So all these are measures that can help or these are showing how inclusive um, the various areas or the various people find themselves within the scholarly communication system in my university. Then what is the current state of affairs in scholarly published? Who gets published? we find out that there are a lot of publications, but who gets published? We've seen that a lot of them are people or individuals with higher educational levels, professors, associate professors, and doc people or individuals with doctorates. Then funding to people who get project funding or research funding are people who get their works published. We also see that there are there is limited access to resources, electronic resources, in to help facilitate publication or research work. Then in terms of nationality, look at how diverse it is. We find out that a lot of publications are coming from the developed countries, and there is a huge deficit of research 
from developing and particularly Africa. Then in terms of race and ethnicity, how many of the research works are coming from the various ethnic groups across the world? We also saw that publication, current publications favors Western English speaking countries. And then there is also research with less access to both commercial publishers. So if you're a researcher and you don't have commercial publishers to aid in the publication, your publication will not be published. Then the state of affairs in scholarly, public, uh, in scholarly publishing, who gets to read? Individuals who get to read published works are people who have institutional affiliation or they have subscriptions at their end or there is interlibrary loan where they can get, they can connect with their libraries to acquire these uh, articles or published works at their end. Then it also excludes those who are under resource. So under resource institutions also find it difficult to read works that have been published. And then also independent researchers. So if you are an independent researcher, it becomes sometimes difficult to get access to published work. Then the funds to pay for professional society to or personal commercial subscription is also very difficult. We are limited by a lot of resources across the globe, Asia and other parts of the world are limited by resources. So if you don't have enough funds to subscribe to articles, it is very difficult to get them. Then also, if you are incapacitated to read English, then you are at a disadvantage because majority of the works are published in English. Then the funds to purchase articles, which I've already talked about, then it favors majority, which is the white, the Western speaking countries. And then piracy hubs also have been a phenomenon now where people use piracy hubs to access latest works. So uh, they're in developing countries like Ghana and other parts of Africa. And a lot of people are using piracy hubs to access public work because of the inability to access these resources. So why are we interested in matters of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Because it's going to, if we are promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion, we are going to ensure fairness and equal opportunity where each and everyone will have access to resources, opportunities, and platforms to share ideas. Then it also enhances quality where we bring a lot a variety of experiences and perspectives to the table when it comes to scholarly publishing. Then it also ensures that there's a strong message about the society and what it reflects. So it reflects societal values, the message, the message about the society and what it reflects in the current global discourse. Then it addresses the longstanding disparity in terms of representation and recognition of marginalized groups across the world. So when we encourage diversity, equity, and inclusion, we are trying to ensure all these key areas in the scholarly communication system. So in terms of stakeholders in the scholarly communication system, what, are, what can they do to support the advocacy for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, in terms of authors, they, we have to make sure that peer reviewers are diverse such that they can understand other languages apart from English. Then also, there can be language services that will support authors when there are challenges or there are errors with their manuscripts. For example, Sage Author Services and other services by Elsevier can help in this regard then peer reviewers can also give extra time or feedback for authors with disability and neurodiverse conditions to make the necessary changes before their manuscripts can be considered. In terms of researchers, they can consider other languages apart from English. Then researchers can also report on the participation. They can report on representation of participants in the study. So if it comes to clinical studies where 
there are a lot of participants or even a community, the researchers can report on them to ensure that they are part of the study. That is inclusiveness. Then they can also adhere, researchers can also adhere to equity reporting guidelines like PRISMA. So this will ensure that individuals who are part of the study are included and there is fair representation of them within the research. Academic institutions, on the other hand, can also award strong mentorship in support of marginalized groups. So there can be a, a, an award scheme where they will support researchers who are into marginalized groups. In the same way, they can also promote researchers who are focused on marginalized groups in order to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. So at the institutional level, they can also undertake this key strategies to help promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. In terms of funding agencies, they can also dedicate funding to underrepresented scholars. So scholars that are focused on underrepresented groups or marginalized groups, as well as scholars who are focused on or who emanate from underrepresented groups can also be given grants to help fund their research because they are focused on marginalized groups and that is a way of bringing inclusiveness. They can also make sure that the funding panel, the, the panel that gives the awards for funding, can, they can also include other scholars who are represented within the global discourse. So in conclusion, what are we trying to see? We are saying that there are there is a perverse there is pervasive biases in the current scholarly communication system. Hence, there is a need for a systemic change. Therefore, there is a need for a consolidated action that will involve all the various stakeholders, publishers, researchers, academic institutions, and funders are also needed on board to help promote and improve the current equity, diversity, and inclu inclusion in the global scholarly communication. Hence, Journals also need to adhere to minimum standards set to monitor the progress of issues on equity, diversity, and inclusion. So we recommend that there's the need to increase advocacy on openness. Open science is gaining grounds in Africa and open access is gaining grounds. So we are recommending that there's the need to increase advocacy for openness. And then journals also have to adopt inclusive publishing practices. Journals also have to make sure that the editorial board, there is fair and diverse representation of the various ethnic groups and other races on the editorial boards. Then there's a need for education and awareness creation. Journals also have to provide progress reports on the steps and measures and how they advance on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pius. It's a great presentation. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat or you could unmute and uh, ask Pius a question. Uh, in the meantime, I have one for you. Uh, you you seem to spend quite a bit of time on um, the inequity representation of uh, peer reviewers uh, from African nations. So uh, can you offer some tips or some ideas to how uh, we, those numbers can be ramped up? I know you had offered one at, at, the, at the tail end of your um, presentation. But like real world sort of what can, uh, if, if an author, if, if an, an academic would like to, to be a peer reviewer, what are some of the tips that you can offer for them okay, to, to so assume a role like that? Yeah. Okay, so I think that um, in terms of the peer review process um, from developing countries like Africa, scholars need some kind of encouragement. They need some kind of recognition. So I will advise that 
Um, since we want to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then specifically on the peer review process, um, journals can have some kind of recognition for peer reviewers from Africa to encourage more uh, people from Africa to, uh, uh, to undertake peer review activities. Awesome. We have enough time for a very brief question. We're at uh, 2.59. If anybody wants to uh, unmute and otherwise we will be jumping over to the next session. Thank you so much, Pius, for your wonderful presentation. And Thanks. I have, very good. I've included the link for the next session um, in the chat. So go on ahead and click over. Best of luck to everyone. I hope you were enjoying the all the great presentations. Thanks again, Pius. Take Thank care. You. Okay. Bye-bye.